Good morning. Welcome to this edition of the Richard Urban Show, where we present news and views from God's point of view. Today, we're happy to have Doug Six, a Republican candidate for governor, on. So please introduce yourself. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, I'm Doug Six. I'm running for, I'm a Republican candidate running for governor of the state of West Virginia. I'm not a polished politician by no means, so you, I will stumble around probably answering questions and giving you my views on things, but please take those as being my true views. I'm a uh, God-fearing young man, live in the country, believe in uh, our rights as citizens of the United States, and especially our rights as citizens of the state of West Virginia. Uh, got 32 years of business experience under my belt. I've been in the real estate business, engineering, surveying, aerial mapping, uh, worked for uh, poultry companies, both in uh, Petersburg, West Virginia, Moorfield, West Virginia, and over in Virginia. I've, uh, I'm 61 years old, live on a farm, enjoy the rural lifestyle of our state and believe our state has so much to offer for every individual out there that wants to come to our state and live we uh, my campaign is uh, probably 98 percent self-funded uh, i do have a few folks that have made some donations but other than that it is uh, all self-funded by myself and my wife my uh, History a little bit is the last 28 years. Uh, I have, my wife and I started a business and grew that business from being in home into uh, roughly 130 employees at one point. Our business is located between two very rural high schools. We support those high schools and we support those individuals that come out of those high schools every day that we can. We believe in training our uh, young folks to grow up and be a productive person within our society. Other than that, uh, I'll let you ask some questions and maybe okay. I'll try Yeah, well, what would you say your um, three main campaign points are or three of your top you know, campaign priorities or priorities for our state, put it that way? Priorities for our state, uh, first off, my priority for our state is to bring our state uh, back into the, uh, into where it should be, up into the top num top states in our, our nation. Uh, and being able to do that, we need to bring our jobs back, which everybody talks about and everybody believes that we need to diversify. But I'm a firm believer in our resources that we have in our state. For the last 28 years, I've dealt with coal, oil, and gas, and believe that uh, that those are very good, sound industries that would allow us to branch off and diversify from there. But our my family has been in the uh, timber and lumbering business for over 40 years within the state. So I, I'm a firm believer in uh, our state taking our resources and making bringing those to the forefront and utilizing those to bring our state back to where it needs to be. So the jobs and our resources are, are two of the things that would, would be on the top of my list. The third thing is that I'm a very open individual. I believe in uh, an open office uh, setting. I believe that our individual voters within our state need to have access to their representatives every day of the week. If they're good enough to vote you in to uh, promote their thoughts and their wants and desires, you should have at least enough courtesy to listen to what they have to say. So I do run open door policy. I would continue that. I would like to set it up to where Every, every, either every two months or every three months that I would, within those three months, visit each county and allow the individuals in the county the time to spend with me and ask questions and find out what's going on. 
probably the largest thing I see in our state that is uh, hurting us right now is that uh, we are, none of us are, are going to be able to predict where this, the coronavirus is going to uh, leave our state financially. Right. Probably our current governor is the only one that has uh, somewhat of a handle on that at this time. That is going to be a major project for whomever is elected. They will need to go through and, and find out where we stand, find out uh, how we're going to spend the monies that our state has or is going to receive. I believe those monies need to be spent directly into programs and projects for our citizens. Not okay. In Could I interject one question about the, um, the COVID-19? So do you feel the governor's handled it well? Uh, many people, myself included, feel there's been a lot of constitutional violations. It's somewhat random. It's way overblown. Many small businesses could or will go out of business, have, you know, gone out of business. Is this really necessary? Is it appropriate? Has he overstepped? Is it about right? Uh, what do you think? Okay. I can criticize our governor in many different ways for the way he's handled the virus. However, none of us other than him know the information that he's been given by the president or the council or the group that is put together to handle the coronavirus. I do not agree that our state shut down. I do not believe, and I'm saying that now based on what I know now, I do not believe we needed to shut down. I believe we needed to target areas and target parts of our of our, our citizens to make sure that they were protected. I believe it's going to create major, major problems for our entire nation and our state. Um, it has taken away our freedoms and we gave up our freedoms very easily. We, uh, the press went out and put the fear in everyone to the point that they just hold up. And we kind of gave up our freedoms without a fight. And now we see that we're gonna have to fight to get those back. Our freedoms did not come cheap. They were paid for by the, bloods of our, by the blood of our forefathers and many others. And we, tend to let people chip away at our constitution and our freedoms in many different aspects. And as they chip away, those small gains that they make wind up being large gains in the end. And we have to be careful. We need to make sure that we protect each and every part of our constitution because those rights were given to us by individuals that came out of not having the freedom that we currently have. And they wanted us to preserve those freedoms. So to answer your question about the coronavirus, yes, we have given up some of our freedoms. We have, those have been trampled on. Should we have shut down? I do not believe we should have shut totally down. We should have done selectively, selective uh, areas or parts of our population that we protected and allowed the, the citizens to continue to function and work. Right. Okay. That's a clear answer. Um, I would have to agree with that as well. Um, on the issue of like the government reach or possible overreach, you know, I was interviewing some of the candidates for Commission of Agriculture. Do you think, I noticed you have some background in like the poultry industry, I believe. Do you think that there are too many regulations for small uh, farms that get in the way of like meat packing or poultry or you think it's about right or do they more favor the larger producers or what's your opinion on that issue? My opinion on that issue is regulations stifle the growth of every industry. Um, regulations are put into place normally to protect the public but however there are small groups of individuals that will make the reg create that causes the, the regulations to be created 
and it does not benefit the majority of the public. It only benefits a small sector. Regulations are not to be uh, used as something that would stifle the growth of our, our current businesses and or future businesses. And those that are, you know, a good example would be one of our DEP. Our DEP needs to be not as much an enforcer, but an enabler that says, in order to make this happen, this is what we see you need to do. Let's work together to make it better for everyone and not stop progress because one small group of individuals believe that we should do that. I just say, so which position are you referring to, the DEP? Pardon? The, I didn't get which position you're referring to or which department. I just all of the departments need to be more open to helping the businesses. Okay. We don't need to be stifling any business in our state because we need every one of those. We need every job. You know, yes, there are essential jobs within our state, but in my opinion, everyone who has a job, it is essential. It's essential to their lifestyle. It's essential to their family. It's essential, it's essential to keep their, them in a, in a positive path to their future. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, that's clear. Yeah. It seems like there are definitely some significant regulatory bar barriers in the agriculture area. I know I was talking about the one candidate about the, um, I think it's called the prime act. Like you can't apparently sell any of your personal processed meat. It's illegal. You can process it, but if you want to sell it, you have to ship it wherever some plant possibly over state lines and things like that seems like a lot of extra regulation. There is a lot of extra regulations. Those regulations for inspection were put in primarily to protect the public. Mm -hmm. um, and just as any other regulation, they continue to grow. And it's like, uh, you know, you kind of lose your freedoms when you, when you let the regulations take over what's going on too much. But we do have to have some to right. protect yeah, I think that's understood that originally was a good intent, maybe in the early 1900s, but it's kind of grown to somewhat of a monster or whatever, or very cumbersome. It's a very cumbersome uh, group of individuals or a group that is out there that, that uh, the USDA, that, that at times they tend to have overreach that, uh, that again, it's like everything else. Instead of being... Uh, an adversary they need to be a friend of business they need to work out the issues and if i i'm a firm believer that if businesses understand that they can work through issues they will do that it's uh business business people normally tend to uh, be like everyone else when you tell them they can't do something they tend to spur up and be ready to go at it tooth and nail with you to make sure that they prove that they can do it Instead of doing that, we need to be more open and say, we can let you do this, but this is what we need to do as a team. Let's make this happen for the benefit of all. Okay. All right. Um, one one uh, issue that I've been working on in West Virginia is the issue of that we're um, one of the fewer states that requires, no, has no exemptions for vaccinations for school children. Meaning, you know, if you don't vaccinate your children, if you don't feel you want to skip a vaccine for whatever reason, religious reasons, personal reasons, any reason, that's absolutely not allowed in West Virginia. There's medical exemptions, supposedly, but I know from talking to a lot of people, they're very hard to get. So, short question is, do you support this kind of system of forced vaccination or no school, or do you think there should be exemptions or you know, is the whole system ripe for an overhaul? What's your opinion on that? I believe that the vaccinations were put into place for a reason. Um, do I support all the current vaccinations that our children have to receive? Uh, I believe probably the current vaccinations because they've grown in such a large number. There are certain vaccinations that probably they should that should be up to the parents. Uh, 
you know, vaccinations were brought into our uh, system because of very deadly diseases. We do not want to go backwards to let those diseases come back into our system at all. But again, I believe your child's rights should be your child. You, you should have the right to determine if your child has those vaccines. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword for a lot of uh, individuals. I honestly believe that that's probably something that should go out and essentially everyone in our state needs to at least have a say in what, what's going on. Because as you said, that is a growing, uh, a growing concern for a lot of parents out there that they really don't believe that their children need to have all the vaccinations that they do. And I believe that's something that should be opened up to allow at least the citizens to have a say in. Uh, I don't believe one person should have that say. Right. Well, you know, I've been working on that issue and I've researched it for like decades now, literally, you know, the, those, those kind of bills don't get traction. Well, I would say what happens is they're all, almost always, except maybe like one rare exception or two, squashed or quashed, I should say, in committee. So usually people have conflicts of interest, in my opinion or analysis, i.e. doctors who belong to certain medical associations and stuff like that and things like that. They don't want these things to see the light of day. I think, you know, they should be discussed, as you said. Yes, sir. Yeah, but so that, that, there are a lot of things that uh, should be discussed that don't get discussed, and the corruption within our government is runs very high right now, and we need to get rid of that too. Very high on my list. Yeah, well, definitely conflicts of interest are uh, a huge um, issue, I think, you know, in, in, well, in that issue and in many other issues. What about, you know, one issue, um, what about the right to work? Like, do you believe in, in a right to work law? I know we have it in West Virginia. It, I know some other candidates are very against it. And I'm not sure about all the gubernatorial, I was talking to one senatorial candidate. He was like, oh, that's terrible. What's your opinion on the right to work law? Well, if you look at the history and the statistics that, um, of the states that have the right to work law in place. Normally those states have uh, companies are, are more willing to move into. And what I would say to those that are against the right to work, when you, when you close that right to work, you, you shut off, you shut out or deter certain companies from coming in and being part of your, uh, economy so we need to not they need all those that are in favor of the of not having a right to work state need to understand the more jobs that we bring in will bring more work for everything that they're in and i know that the trades and the unions are very much against a right to work but in order for us to be able to grow and to give those members of those trades additional work and consistent work, we need to be an open state that doesn't mean, doesn't say that in order for you to walk in, you have to have a card or pay dues. I honestly believe that should be an individual's right. The unions have a lot of good things. I mean, they have great pensions, they have great insurance, they have a lot of things that go for them. And they were put into place for a wonderful reason. However, when it comes to putting your state at risk and everyone around you at risk for a job, I believe that we should not do that. So I have no issues with right to work. Um, and I have no issues, you know, we talk about, I've been asked the same question about the prevailing wage. Um, if a, if a job or a project within our state is required because of the funding for prevailing wage, I have no issue. That to me is, we, that's a, a step that we have to cross over. Uh, I do believe that, our, that the people that live in our state and work hard 
deserve to be paid a fair wage. So whether you're, you're talking whether about you're, the um, so-called mandatory minimum wage, is that what you are or something? Well, else? if you talk about mandatory minimum wage, we can talk about mandatory minimum. No, wage. I'm trying to say what what can you define? I'm sorry, I should know probably, but what is the prevailing wage versus the prevailing the wage? wage? The prevailing wage normally comes from a federal funded monies that come either from federal or certain state funds that require the contractor to pay the prevailing wage that is is published by essentially is is published by the department of labor okay. um, whether that's the case or not uh, minimum wage is different uh, okay. minimum wage if you want me to talk about it i'd have to redo that yeah no no i thought i, I, I so you're talking about something else. You're talking about prevailing wage for certain federal contracts, not the so-called yes. mandatory minimums. Okay. One thing I wanted to ask about, this may be a little different question, but it's close to my heart. You know, when you think about the long-term effects of things like poverty or opioid use or so many other things, you know, out, uh, outside of marriage, pregnancy, all those things, I'm wondering, should we have an approach and this isn't maybe so much a government thing, but something I'm wondering what you personally think, where we encourage youth to stay absent before marriage, like our nonprofit does that. Is that something that like should be encouraged or not? Or what do you think? Meaning stay absent because then if they have a stable family, that addresses many of the issues that we see nowadays. What do you think? Well, I totally agree with what you're saying, okay? Because we can continue to subsidize our programs, but we're putting that emphasis after, after everything's already been happened. Instead of going back, you know, it's kind of like whipping the tail of the snake to kill it. You, you never do. You have to go to where the problem, the root of the problem is. And, and what you're saying about, we need to promote our youth not to be as promiscuous as they are. They need, we need to, we need to promote them. Uh, we, we, send, we seem to have developed an issue within our society that we believe that our children have to be popular. And in order for them to be popular, they have to do certain things. We need to change that popularity. We need to change the mindset that being, to be popular means that you you do something well with your life, that you're, you, you make something out of yourself and you don't get yourself into trouble. Um, I, have, I deal with a lot of young individuals uh, over the years that, you know, yes, they, whether you call them mistakes or not, they, they stick with it, their family, they stick with their children, and they continue to work and try and make, make good for that. We have a lot of children in our state that don't, that doesn't happen. They become foster children. They, and we need to go back to some basics. We need to be teaching in school that, that those are some basics that we need to have. When I grew up, that wasn't an issue. It's become a very large issue now. And okay. I think we need to work on that. Yes, sir. All right. All right. That's good to hear. Well, I think we're coming more toward the conclusion. Just want to ask, like, how would you compare to the other, you know, uh, Republican gubernatorial candidates? I think we have some six or plus or six there. Uh, how would you differentiate yourself? Why would the voters choose you versus, say, the other five or so? Well, I am. I guess that I would say that you could choose me if you really want to change. If you want to change from a politician that knows the system and knows how to work the system and, and, and will work the system for their benefit and not your benefit, then you probably should vote for one of the other candidates. If you want someone that's gonna back you as a citizen of our state and try and help our state bring itself up and try to make our state a better place to live as far as, it's hard to make it a better place to live. Our state's a beautiful state. But as far as, as our uh, being a productive individual in our state, if that's what you want and you want to see our state become productive and not go down the same path, I'm the individual. I'm honest, I'm trustworthy, trustworthy, 
and I will be very accountable to each and every individual in our state, not just a few. So that's kind of where I'm at. That's great. Okay, thank you for sharing. Anything else you'd like to uh, share with the viewers in conclusion? Just please make sure that you go and vote. It's very important. It doesn't matter who you vote for. Do not give up those rights. Those rights are, have been fought for for many, many years and are being continued every day. Our servicemen fight for those rights. So please take those rights seriously and go and vote. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, do vote June 9th. There are many, uh, of course, the gubernatorial primaries, but also you have no less than three Supreme Court just out of five. That's unprecedented. And you're a school board, magistrates, and um, the, uh, yeah, I think sheriffs. <laughs> so those candidates will be elected June 9th only. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Richard Urban. Uh, thank you for joining us, Mr. Six. Coming to you from Historic Harper's Ferry, and we will see you next time.